Good morning, Vibrant Church. My name is Courtney, and I'm married to that handsome guy that was just talking to you guys up here. And we are the student pastors here at Vibrant Church, and I am so honored to get to speak to you guys today. What a privilege. And I just hope that I can instill some hope into each and every one of you in this room. So as you can see, we're continuing our Running with the Giants series. And so this series is where we run and we look to Hebrews 12, to the Hall of Fame of faith. This is where all the people are listed that are like the VIPs of faith. And so basically what this series does is we get to take a lap with one of them each week so that we can spend some one-on-one -on -one time and learn from them and get encouragement from them. And so last week, Pastor Marco talked to us about Samson, and he talked about how so often we can become blind to our purpose and our relationships. But this week, I'm going to be talking to you guys about Sarah, and many of us know her as Abraham's wife and the mother of many nations, but I think you will be surprised at how relatable she actually is whenever you get down to it. And so if you guys will please stand with me as we honor the reading of the word. So our verse for this series is Hebrews 12.1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses, that's all the VIP people in the faith, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Lord, we just thank you, God, that you are the perfecter of our faith, God. And I just pray, Lord, that as we dive into Sarah's story, God, that we would just be able to grasp what it is that you have for us. God, I pray that every single person in this room would gain something from this, God, that you would be able to speak to them exactly what it is that you want them to hear, God, and that their heart would be ready to receive it and their ears open to hear it, God. And we just thank you and we praise you. All right, you guys can be seated. Amen. So in that verse, there is that word perseverance. And so basically what that means is patient endurance. And so Sarah has to have quite a bit of patient endurance, and she doesn't get it right all the time. And there have been times in my life where I have not got that right. I have not always been the most patient person. So some of you guys in here may know this about me, but if you don't, you're about to learn. But I, for quite a few years now, have been obsessed, for lack of a better word, with corgis. They're the short little dogs with the short legs and the fluffy bottoms, and they're so cute, and I am obsessed. And I've been obsessed with them for forever. In, whenever I was in college, I used to do this thing called the 12 Days of Corgi Christmas, where I would post a picture every day, the month of December, of a corgi in like an elf costume or Santa costume. And it was adorable, and everybody loved it. So then I started dating Brad, and he's like, what is this obsession that you have with corgis? I don't really get it. I don't really understand. And so while we were dating, there were multiple times where I tried to buy a corgi on the Courtney budget, which is like a mutt, like maybe like 5% corgi and like the rest some other kind of dog. And he promised me, he said, Courtney, if you will wait till we get married, I promise that I will get you a corgi. So how that interpreted to me is the day after our honeymoon, when we get back, we will have a corgi. That is what I thought that meant. Okay, the promise is when we get married, I get a corgi. Hooray. But little did I know that Christmas would come, and we would get back from the airport, and there would be no corgi. My birthday would come, and I would get a bouquet of flowers, but there was nothing barking in our home. Then our anniversary came, and I was like, oh, this is it, because we had kind of started talking about it around that time. Still no corgi. So I start to get frustrated. I get frustrated at Brad at why would you promise me that you would get me a corgi when we got married if you're not going to fulfill it? And I would start to create these problems out of nothing. I would get mad about the littlest things that had nothing to do with a dog, but I would throw in there, and you said you would get me a dog, and you never did. Or... I would lose sight of the plan. The plan was to get a dog after we got married, but since it didn't happen how I wanted it to, I got mad. And then I started to get bitter. 
And there were many times that my friends would ask me, oh, when are you guys going to get a dog? Yeah, most people, they get married and people are like, when are you going to have kids? For me, it was like, when are you going to get that dog? But so I got, to, I got bitter. But last Christmas, I got the best surprise that I think I could have ever got. And he surprised me with our little Winston. I was going to put a picture up there, but it's just too cute. But he has an Instagram, at Winston Heathcock, if you want to follow him. But he is the most handsome, sweetest, greatest dog. And I could not have asked for a better puppy. But that's because Brad's plan never wavered. He kept his promise But I chose to get bitter and frustrated and mad because it didn't happen how I wanted. And so often, God gives us these promises. And because they don't look how we want them to look and they don't happen how we want them to happen, we get frustrated at God. We get mad. We start to create problems out of nothing. We lose sight of the plan and the purpose because our God never wavers from his plan and purpose. We do. We are the ones that step out of line and get mad and point our fingers. God never does that. And I think what's so cool about Sarah's story is she was a little bit like me at times, where God gave her a promise and he never wavered, but she got frustrated and bitter and doubted and didn't believe. And so we're going to look to Genesis 15, 1 through 6 and start at the beginning of her story. Sometime later, the Lord spoke to Abram. So this is what Abraham's name was before God changed his name to Abraham in a vision, and said to him, do not be afraid, Abram, for I will protect you, and your reward will be great. But Abram replied, O sovereign Lord, what good are all your blessings when I don't even have a son? Sometimes God gives us those promises, and we're too busy worrying about that promise not coming through that we don't even realize all the other blessings. He's like, what good are are your blessings if I don't have this one thing that I want? Since you've given me no children, a servant in my household will inherit all of my wealth. You have given me no descendants of my own, so one of my servants will be my heir. Then the Lord said to him, No, your servant will not be your heir, for you will have a son of your own who will be your heir. Then the Lord took Abram outside and said to him, Look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. I think that's hilarious. God's like, count them if you can. So often we're like, God, I just wish that, that I could see what you see and know what you know so that this wouldn't be so hard. But God has his own dilemma of like he can see from the beginning to the end. And he's like, well, I wish that you could count these stars so that you would understand. But you can't because only I can do that. And that's how many descendants you will have. And Abram believed the Lord and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. So the first thing that I think we can learn from Sarah is that true faith doesn't have a timeline. So for those of you who don't know Sarah's story, this promise of a son and this promise of having all of these descendants that are as many as the stars, this came 25 years before it ever happened. And I think what's so important for us to get from this is that the promise was given while they were still able to see it, but the promise was fulfilled when they had to believe it. The promise was given when they were still in childbearing years. They could still see, oh yeah, we could probably have kids, like God's promising this to us, but that's not how it happened. It happened when they had to have faith and they had to believe. And there are going to be things in your life that God promises you in a season where it makes total sense. You're like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. But it may not come to fruition until you have to believe it. And the thing about faith is that true faith, it doesn't have a timeline. It's not, God, if you don't show up in six months, I'm out. God, if you don't show up in two years, I'm done. Because if I would have done that to Brad... We would have been done a long, long time ago because literally seven days after we got married, I was like, where's this dog? But that's not what happened in our story either. But true faith is trusting God until, trusting God until the promise comes, trusting God until he has shown himself faithful. And so 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. 
A moment of patience, you guys, could save you a lifetime of regret. It says here instead that he is patient with us. The Lord is patient with us, so we need to be patient with him. A moment of patience could save you a lifetime of regret. A moment of patience with your spouse could save you a lifetime of regret. A moment of patience with your boss could save you a lifetime of regret. A moment of patience with your friends, with your coworkers, could save you a lifetime of regret. In financial freedom, which is the class that we had a about a month ago, we talked about waiting before you make a big purchase. I think it was like wait 30 days before you like blow all this money on something. But that moment of patience can save you a lifetime of regret and debt, right? So the second thing that I think we can learn from Sarah is to don't complicate God's promise with your own solution. Sometimes we complicate God's promise by trying to come up with our own solutions and do it our own way. And Sarah did exactly this. In Genesis 16, 1 through 2, it says, Now Sarai, which is her name before God changed her name to Sarah, which is actually really cool because she is the only woman in the Bible whose name was changed by God. So even though, as we're about to see, she didn't get it all right, God still rewarded her. Um, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had not been able to bear children for him, but she had an Egyptian servant named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has prevented me from having children. Go and sleep with my servant. Perhaps I can have children through her. And Abram agreed. And so basically he took Hagar, the servant, and she became his wife. So before Sarah came up with her own solution, she allowed a lie to creep in. I don't know if you caught this, but in that verse, she says, the Lord has prevented me. And some of you guys in here are allowing the lies to creep in when it comes to your promise. You're allowing the enemy to convince you that it's too good to be true. You're allowing the enemy to point out your weaknesses to where you begin to not believe what God has said about you. You're allowing the lie to creep in that, oh God, this is your fault. You gave me this promise. Why isn't it coming true? And then after she believes the lie, then she decides to take matters into our, in her own hands. So often, we wouldn't take matters into our own hands if the enemy wasn't spreading lies and creeping into our minds. Because when God gives us the promise, we're excited, we're pumped, and we're like, yes, God, I'm going to do this for you. But then the enemy comes in, and then that's when we change the plans. And the thing about taking matters into our own hands is that it never only impacts us. It never only impacts you. Sarah's doubt and unbelief caused Hagar to step out of her promise. Sarah's doubt caused her own husband to step out of his promise. And so I want you guys to think about it. Is anything in my life taking someone else out of their promise? Is anything that I'm doing causing someone else to sin or to stumble or to not be able to walk in all that God has for them? And Hagar conceives a child And those two families are in conflict ever since. And so when we take matters into our own hands, we ruin relationships. We ruin friendships. We ruin families. And the third thing that we can learn from Sarah is that God is so much bigger than your doubt. So much bigger. We literally serve a God who spoke everything that we know into motion. We serve a God that, like Busao was saying earlier, parted the Red Sea. He had people walk around a wall praising, and the wall comes down. Yet we doubt. Yet we wonder, well, can he do this for me? I saw that he did this for them, but I don't know if he can do it for me. And we begin to settle for less than God has for us. When the promise God has given us seems too big, we begin to settle for less than. When it reminds us of our weaknesses and things that we're not super great at all the time, we begin to settle. And we cheat ourselves out of the promise God has for us for momentary comfort and satisfaction. But we serve a God that works in big ways. Sarah was 90 years old when she gave birth to her son. Can y'all imagine... Being in Target, no, that's right, that's right. 
can y'all imagine like walking through Target and you're like passing the maternity section and then you look and you see like a pregnant grandma? Like how weird that would be? That would be so weird. I guess y'all don't think it's as weird as I do, but I think that's weird. And we can't fathom that because it's crazy. It's wild. But we serve a God that wants to do something wild in your life. He wants to do something that people would look at you and say, I don't know why you believe that God's going to do that. Or, that's foolish of you. Why would you do that? Like Busayo said earlier, they literally, they've fought for years, but they just decided to pray around the wall and it fell. I'm just saying, if I walked by, I'd be like, I don't know if y'all are going to win that battle. But they did because they serve a big God. And we serve a God that wants to do something wild and big in your life if you let him. He has a plan and a purpose for every single one of you in this room. And he knows every single desire in your heart. And he does not want you to settle for less than. Our very best is no match for what God has for us. And so as we're finishing this lap with Sarah around the track, she looks at us and she says, hey, Just being honest, I didn't get it right all the time. I caused people a lot of hurt. I doubted a lot. Literally, if you Google Sarah in the Bible, like one of the first things it says is, but Sarah did not believe. She is literally known for her doubt. But yet if you look to Hebrews 11.11, it says, and by faith, even Sarah who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And I love that. Even Sarah, because sometimes I feel like that. Even Courtney, she did it. Even her. But even she made it into the hall of fame of faith because of her faith. God is going to use your biggest obstacle for his glory. He used her doubt to strengthen her faith. He used her not believing that he was going to fulfill the promise to show her that he could so that she would be known in in history for her faith. And so here's some encouragement that I think that Sarah would want to share with us. So some of you in this room are stuck in the middle of a promise. You're stuck in a season of waiting. Maybe you're stuck wondering, what's my next step? What do I need to do? But here's what I want to share with you for that question. What do we do in the waiting? What do we do in the waiting? Well, just like he did for Sarah, he always, always keeps his promises. But sometimes it takes time and we're going to need to wait. But the secret to patience is to do something else in the meantime. To do something else in the meantime. The secret to patience is not just to stand here. You know, they have that saying, like, a watch pot never boils. The secret to patience is not just to stand here and, like, wait. Like, okay, God, you promised me this. I'm just going to wait here. Because that's where the frustration comes in. And the trying to create our own plan and the doubt comes in. The Bible says the words to stand 665 times in the Bible. The Bible is a very big book, but that's quite a bit of times. That's quite a bit of reminders that we need to stand. But when we are waiting on the promise, we need to stand. We need to stand on the promise that he gave us. We need to stand on his word and his truth. We need to stand in faith. Because when we're standing in faith, the lies of the enemy are going to come. The voices are going to come. In those quiet seasons of waiting, the voices are going to become louder. But which voice are you going to listen to? Your friends, your coworkers, your family, social media, or the Lord? Ephesians 6.11 says, put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Let me tell you guys something. When God gives you a promise... The enemy is going to come, and he is going to do whatever he can to get you to doubt, to run away from that promise, to run away from God, to isolate yourself. But God's word says to stand firm. And one of the ways that we can do that is through worship. When we worship, we are standing firm on the truth and the promises of God. I'm going to go a little psychology on you guys for a minute, so bear with me. I was a psych major. 
But did you guys know that when we speak, sound waves travel and they bounce off and they hit our ears and a new neuron is created in our brain? A new thought, a new thought pattern. And the more we speak those things or hear those things, the stronger and more rooted and more firm those thoughts become. And that's why it's so important to choose wisely what voices we listen to because what people are speaking to us are getting rooted in our head. But when we worship, when we clap our hands, when we raise our hands, when we proclaim truth and victory over our lives, that creates a new thought too. And the more that we worship and the more that we proclaim that truth, the stronger that thought gets and the less stronger those negative thoughts become. And when we spend time with Jesus, he begins to reveal things to us and reveal more of that promise, little bits at a time. When you spend time with Jesus, you see Jesus in everything around you. When you spend time with Jesus, you switch your focus, you switch it off of the doubt and onto the God that is more than able. But... Like I said, the Bible says to stand 665 times, and sometimes we have to be reminded that many times in one day, and sometimes we have to be reminded that many times in one minute. 665 times to stand, to do something, to proclaim the truth, to read his word, to spend time with him. That is what we do in the waiting. That is what we do in the waiting. And Something else that I would encourage you guys to do is when God gives you a promise or a word, write it down. Write it down in your journal so in these hard seasons of waiting, you can look back and say, oh, wait, but he fulfilled that one. Oh, and he fulfilled that one. Oh, and that one that I never thought he would fulfill, he did that too. That is what we do in the waiting. We stand firm on his promises. And as I begin to close, I want you guys to Go away with this thought. Patience is not the ability to wait, but it's how you act while you're waiting. What's your attitude in the waiting? How are you acting towards the people in your life in the waiting? Hopefully it's not like how I was with wanting that dog where I got frustrated, where I got bitter, I got mad, but how, how do you act? It's kind of like, have you guys ever been like in the store and there's the kid in line in front of you and he's trying to grab that candy by the aisle? People in stores are so smart for putting that candy there because the kids always want it. And the parent says, no, you can't have that. And the kid is so mad and so frustrated. But the parent did that because they knew what was coming and they knew that they needed to develop the character trait in them that they can't get what they want all the time. And sometimes God, when we are in the season of waiting, he wants to do more in our character than he wants us to be comfortable. And so as I begin to close this last scripture, James 1, 2 through 4, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, produces patient endurance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. Vibrant Church, if you are in a season of testing, it's because God wants to produce patient endurance in you. He wants to produce more in you and to grow you. And so just remember that. We always say here at Vibrant Church that you're either coming out of a trial, going into one, or you're about to go into one, or you're in one right now. And so just know that the testing of your faith is there to produce perseverance.